Today's reading is uh, from Revelations chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil, and Satan, and bound them for a thousand years, and threw him into the abyss, and shut it, and sealed it over him, so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until a thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. That's today's reading. Good evening. Glad you could make it. Wednesday Bible study, Courts Community Bible Church. Tonight, once again, Revelation chapter 20, and we're not going to be moving very fast. And uh, in fact, we're looking at three verses, the three verses that Greg just read. But in those three verses, there are some things that we need to slow down about. In fact, the first few verses in the book of Revelation chapter 20 are filled with some things that throughout the years, when I first began reading and studying in the book of Revelation, just seemed confusing. And I hope that we'll be able to uh, see or help remedy any confusion that some of us might have when we uh, go through this chapter. It uh, has to do with uh, the end of the tribulation period, what happens, and it has to do with um, uh, the millennial reign of Christ, the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ, which is uh, an exciting time. And we feel that the day and age in which we're living in uh, means that uh, that could be very close. So it's important for us to understand uh, some of the details that are going to be taking place ahead of time. Just now, let's open up in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to be here uh, this evening. We ask your blessing on each that are here and those that are listening in, Facebook or uh, YouTube. And now, Spirit of God, we pray that you might speak to our hearts through your word and help us to understand these truths and to uh, follow the truths that we learn and to be blessed thereby. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Okay, um, <coughs> Revelation chapter 20 and verse 1. We covered uh, some of this last time. But I want uh, to review a little bit. I have a chart here. We're going to be looking at this chart a little bit. It'll be a little difficult to be able to see. But uh, the details will be there, and I'll read it and explain it as we go along. And in verse 1, Revelation chapter 20, it says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent, of old, who is the devil and Satan. Well, look at those. Uh, let, let's look at those titles. He laid hold of the dragon. So we see a dragon. Uh, he's described here as the dragon. And then it says that serpent. Remember the serpent in the garden? Um, some scientists have said that uh, it's uh, very possible that uh, uh, snakes which uh, wiggle and uh, make their way on their bellies through the on the ground may have had a couple of appendages, a couple of legs at one time. And that's when we go in the Old Testament, we see that uh, God cursed the serpent and said, you will therefore, you will crawl on your belly. Very interesting. So he's called the serpent here. And of course, this serpent uh, allowed itself to, to be possessed. Satan is not uh, an actual snake. But uh, Adam, you have to understand, Adam and Eve, there were no uh, animals that were uh, carnivorous or that were poisonous. It was a paradise. And so for the snake to come along uh, wouldn't be unusual. But for it to talk, that would be unusual. Uh, the animals didn't talk. And so Satan, of course, is called here. He said... Uh, the, the hold of the dragon. This is the, this is the angel here. This is a, having a key to the bottomless pit, a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon. This dragon, represented by the dragon in Scripture uh, many times, and that serpent of old. And then it says, who is the devil? And then finally, and Satan. 
His first name given to him was Lucifer, which means uh, light bearer. Uh, but now, of course, he's fallen from that name, and uh, he's called the devil and Satan the deceiver. And it says, and it bound him for a thousand years. This was the angel that bound him. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he could do not deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Okay, uh, in the book of Revelation, this is the only place that gives us the length of the millennium. The millennium is the 1,000 year uh, reign of Christ on earth. When does it take place? After the tribulation period. Most of us know that, those that are listening in. Uh, it's important, six times is the time, uh, the length of time given to us, 1,000 years. And the millennium means 1,000. And so uh, this begins at the end of the tribulation period and it will go on for 1,000 years. It is for the Jewish kingdom, the fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise. Uh, God made promises to Abraham and to his descendants, and so now is the time he's going to fulfill that. The reformers, the covenant theologians, those who came uh, initially out of the Roman Catholic Church and uh, during the days of Reformation, um, for the most part, took with them an understanding that uh, of, of amillennialism, uh, that there wasn't going to be a thousand year rule of Christ. In fact, they thought that the first thousand years might fulfill that until the first thousand years completed and uh, life went on and there was no uh, kingdom of Christ on earth as Revelation chapter 21 22 says. Uh, and so uh, today we have those that have no uh, belief in a rapture. And a rapture is the Latin word for catching away, which is mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, is that the Lord is going to come from the heavens as far as the clouds. It says that. He's not coming down to the Mount of Olives. He's not coming down into Jerusalem. He is going to come to the clouds and at, in the clouds, the dead in Christ will be raised first. That is the bodies of those that are resting in the graves and many of them in ashes. But the, it's, we're speaking of the bodies, not the souls and the spirits. The soul and the spirit are that part of us that is our personhood and our God consciousness or our God unconsciousness. The person who is not born again has a spirit, but it's, it's dead. It doesn't mean that it's dormant, it's active, but it's only active towards uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil. So the dead in Christ will be raised first, and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. All right, let's talk about the pre-tribulation rapture. You got on TV going on, and rightly so, because we need to be educated. You, we've got on TV those that say seven reasons why there is not going to be a pre-tribulation rapture. Then you've got one that says four or five reasons why there's not going to be a tribulation rapture. Then you've got those who have written recently 13 reasons why. Well, there's some confusion and there's some misunderstanding, and there aren't any of us that have it all perfect perfectly uh, right. But there are those that have a greater understanding. Uh, the Bible says the rapture is a mystery. Okay? And a mystery was something that was not taught in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament it's taught. And it's also called the Blessed Hope. It's a time when Christ comes back, but he only comes as high as clouds. Revelation 4 I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, same picture. The clouds, it doesn't stop there. It doesn't say, and after he gathers us, he comes back and brings us to the earth. It doesn't say that. It does say something else. Somebody raise their hand there. 
Uh, no, it says, he will catch us up to himself. The dead in Christ should be raised first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, wherefore comfort one another with these words. John chapter 14, 1, 2, and 3, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, where is he? In heaven, there ye may be also. The promise to the church is that we're going to be caught up. He's going to personally come and he's going to receive us to himself and he's going to keep us with him. Now listen, this is the clouds. It doesn't say anything about it, then he's going to return to the earth. There's going to be a rapture. This takes place before the tribulation period. The second coming takes place after the tribulation period. When Christ comes back, it says clearly, mounted on a white stallion and a, 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 a crown uh, of gold and a, a scepter of diadems, uh, a crown of diadems and a scepter of righteousness. He's going to come down. It says nothing in Revelation 19 that he's going to catch up the church. Church isn't there. He says nothing. Uh, he talks about he's coming. There's going to be a battle. And, uh, and when the battle, battle isn't going to be instant. Read in uh, the book of Zechariah. Anyone who reads the book of Zechariah is going to have a, an understanding about that the tribulation period, and of course the book of Daniel, and all the minor prophets, and Isaiah and Jeremiah and uh, Ezekiel, all of, these cha all of these books are going to tell us about God's plans for Israel, the time of Jacob's trouble, and the time of uh, Daniel's 70th week. It's It's... God is going to be working with Israel. It's going. Uh, we we learn this. I'm saying these things at the end of uh, Revelation chapter 19, the beginning of Revelation chapter 20, because uh, we need to be able to put the pieces together of what's taking place. And so here we're going to see Christ coming back. He's going to be at, at the end of the tribulation period. And he's going to be setting his feet down at the Mount of Olives. There, the, there's going to be a, a, a dividing of, of north and uh, south and, and east and west of the valley, a, a, a river. And uh, there's going to be the Valley of Esdraeli. And of course, this is going to be where all of the armies of the world, plus there are going to be angels that are going to be sent forth. They're going to go all over the world. They're not coming to pick up the church. No, it's clear. Who are they coming to pick up? All those that had received the mark of the beast, all those that are lost, that are still alive on the earth. And they're going to be brought there to this same battle because the blood that's going to flow is going to be, as we, we said, up to 200 miles. You can't get that with 200 million men in, or soldiers. It would be a couple billion that would fill this. And, of course, then the birds are going to come. The great supper of the great God which is also found in Revelation chapter 19. And uh, where is the church? The church is coming back with them. It's found in Revelation 19, verses uh, 7 through 9. And uh, we've got on the robes of righteousness. Coming back, verse 14 says, those who have on the robes of righteousness coming back. And it's going to be coming to the earth. And uh, then the battle is going to take place. And after that, and by the way, it's going to be some uh, demons uh, uh, battling too, because we see that the Revelation chapter 17, I'm sorry, 12, uh, that there's a battle taking place in the heavens presently, and so it's between whom? The good angels and the bad angels. So that's going to take place. All right, so uh, what about uh, the church? We're coming back with him. Israel is going to be um, uh, enlightened. Read Revelation, uh, I'm sorry, Zechariah chapter 12, 13, and 14, enlightened. One third of the Jews are going to be left, and those are the ones that are going to be saved. They're called the elect. Uh, and the Christ will set up his millennial reign. Now what about, uh, we'll go over this in a future study, but what about the 13 reasons why that the rapture doesn't take place at the beginning? There's a misunderstanding and a confusion there is that those prophecies that were made by Jesus in Matthew 24 is concerning the Jews. Yes. 
It's concerning the Jews, not the church. And so all of those uh, prophecies that have to do with uh, Christ's coming and uh, uh, the promises, and by the way, you know, the different uh, pre-tribulation uh, judgments that are going to happen before the tribulation and during the tribulation, it's going to be something that describes exactly what's happening with the Jews. Okay, so now that we've covered that, uh, we're looking here uh, that Satan, well, first of all, the false prophet and the devil, I'm sorry, and his prophet is going to be, uh, the, 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 the Antichrist and the false prophet is going to be uh, taken and placed into Gehenna, uh, into hell. They'll be the first ones in hell, and we talked about that last time. And Satan now is said that he is going to be taken and he is going to be placed in the, and we're reading here in verse 1 into the bottomless pit. And shut up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years are finished, but after these things he must be released for a little while. Okay, bottomless pit. What is the bottomless pit? Uh, the abuso is the Greek term. And this is a place of judgment where fallen demons are placed by God, by Christ, and cannot escape. And it's before hell takes place. Is the bottomless pit Hades? Is the bottomless pit Tartarus? Okay? And that's what we want to discuss today. Okay. First of all, um, we find the bottomless pit, pit mentioned in Revelation 9, 1 through 11. Remember? A star <laughs> fell from heaven. And it was uh, given to this uh, personage to open up the bottomless pit. Out of the bottomless pit, by the way, that most people believe that Satan was falling from heaven. And why do we say that? Is because the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12 that Satan is going to fall from heaven. And so he'll be given the key to the bottomless pit. And um, let, let's, let's talk about the differences between the bottomless pit and uh, Tartarus. And let's talk about the difference between the bottomless pit and hell. And let's talk about the differences between the bottomless pit and Hades. Okay, th those are some interesting terms. Okay, uh, first of all, we have a place called Hades. And Hades, that's the actual pronunciation, the Greek term that is transliterated in the English pronunciation, Hades. Hades is equivalent to the Old Testament term Sheol. So if you're reading in your Bibles and you're reading the word Sheol, uh, that word is equivalent to the word Hades. Now what is Sheol? Sheol is, can, can be um, used in different contexts, but it's a, I think it's important we understand this. The Sheol is interpreted at times as the grave. This person died and went to Sheol. And sometimes it means to the grave. Same with Hades. It's just the New Testament term for Sheol. But also Sheol is a place of the, uh, for, of the, the, the departed souls. Both good and bad. And how do we find out more about Sheol? Well, we see its equivalency in uh, the New Testament. The, the term is Hades. In the book of Luke, chapter 16, it talks about uh, this place of torment. And the, the uh, rich man who had, I like the King James Version, fared sumptuously, uh, uh, but was selfish and obviously not born again, went to a place uh, called Hades, a place of torment. It was a, it's a temporary place. It's like hell. There are some evangelicals, I'm not going to give denominational titles, but there are some evangelicals that think that Hades is hell. There are some evangelicals that will even say, hey, try to remember this, that Hades is hell number one. Yeah. And that... Uh, the, the Gehenna, which is a different term, is, uh, is the eternal hell. There's nowhere in Scripture that you can uh, put that together, but that's fine. I'm just giving, a, giving a, a, a distinction between the two. Hades and hell. 
Now, Gehenna was taken from a place of a trash heap where the uh, Israelis or the Jews would come and they'd bring all their refuse, all of their uh, uh, garbage, and they'd push it over to the cliff and they would keep this fire burning called Gehenna, where the worm dieth not. And they'd put their dead animals down this and would continue. And so that was the term that was used in the Bible to describe what hell is, is going to be like. That was the physical term that described the spiritual term that hell is going to be like. Uh, Gehenna, but it, in, in the New Testament it's, it's uh, uh, translated hell. Is there anyone in hell today? No. Is there anyone in Hades today? Yes. If you go and you use the term Sheol, is there anyone in Sheol today? Yes, because the terms are equivalent. Who is in Hades today? All unbelieving uh, souls. All those that died without uh, belief in, in, in God, without uh, trust in Christ. That's where they're at. They're in a place of torment, Luke chapter 16. Where was the good part of Hades? And some would say, well, how can you call that the good part of Hades? It's called Abraham's bosom. It's called paradise. Remember what Christ said to the, uh, uh, the, the thief on the cross? He said, today you will be with me in paradise. He didn't say in heaven, did he? Nope. Do you know where paradise is today? In heaven. He led captivity captive, and some interpret that to mean that Christ, when he died, he took those believers in Abraham's bosom or paradise, and he took them to heaven. Now, the reason that uh, we, we see that uh, we're not looking at believers who die to go to Hades today is because the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 uh, and verse 8 that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And there's a good reason why the Bible doesn't teach soul sleep. Remember, um, uh, the Sadducees didn't believe there was a resurrection. Uh, but uh, the, we, we, we gain more insight when we come into the New Testament. And we know that when Christians die now, the bodies are laid in the grave. And the Bible calls that sleep. And that's not soul sleep because there's activity that's going in heaven of believers that are there presently. Uh, and it says that uh, to be absent from the body is going to be present with the Lord. That quick, a twinkling of an eye. We find that throughout the New Testament. So when a believer dies now, it's absent from the body, present with the Lord. But we've got in this passage right here, Satan being cast into the bottomless pit. Now some believe that the bottomless pit is Tartarus. Some believe that there's synonymous, and some also believe that the bottomless pit is Hades. What do we say about Hades? We can see, and I'm going to reflect again, to, you need to go over Luke chapter 16 and read the passage. This man had died apart from Christ, and he's in Hades, and he's in torment, and he's asking... He can see uh, Abraham across this deep chasm, and on his side there's a paradise there, and he can see them. So if you want to call it uh, a paradise, which it is, if you want to call it Abraham's bosom, which it is, but if you don't want to call it Hades, you don't have to. Hey, Sheol was a place of those that had died, both those that were uh, believers and those that were not believers. And so if Hades is the equivalency to Sheol, then that's why we would say that that's the good part of Hades, like the good part of Sheol. And so um, we have here a place called Hades. If you're going to die today and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, that's where you're going. You're not going to hell yet. It's a temporary holding place. Uh, but you will be released. Uh, at the great white throne judgment. I'm going to look at this chart here in a minute. You won't be able to see it real clearly, but I'm going to describe it because it shows a distinction. And so uh, the great white throne judgment that takes place is going to uh, bring those who are presently in Hades up to uh, the, the, the judgment bar of God, the great white throne judgment. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15. They are all going to be judged. They are all going to be cast uh, with their bodies 
into spirits and soul, body, everything, into the lake of fire. Gehenna is the terminology that's used. Okay, the angels that are fallen angels, they too are going to be cast into this lake of fire, which is called Gehenna, and it will be eternal. It will be a place where God never shows his face. They will never be released. Whereas Hades, they were released. Only to come and appear before the great bar judgment of God. All right. What about the bottomless pit? Is that Hades? There are those that say that the bottomless pit is Hades. Because in, Dan, or in uh, Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, particularly it speaks about uh, those demons who are released through verse 11, who are released from the bottomless pit. And they come out with all kinds of horrible visages, you know, scorpions and different types, and they go around the earth, and now they are freed to uh, uh, torture mankind, except for those that have the seal of God in their foreheads. During the period of uh, the seven years, God is going to seal the 144,000 uh, Jews, uh, from these uh, attacks of uh, the devil or Satan, all of these demons that come up out of the bottomless pit, as well as those believers in Revelation chapter 7. I say believers. I didn't say Christians. What makes you a Christian? Think about that for a minute. You must have the Holy Spirit. You must be He must be in you. You must be placed into the body of Christ. You become the body of Christ. The promise that is given you is Matthew chapter uh, 16 and verse 18. What does it say? Jesus says to Peter, who has just made the confession of faith, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. This was promised and prophesied in the Old Testament that Christ, which means anointed one, the anointed of God, the Son of God. And the world cannot know this, and that's what Jesus said to Peter. He said, uh, Flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but only my Father which is in heaven. If a person can be enlightened as to the truth of who Jesus Christ is, and that's through the gospel today, and that's through the convicting work of the Holy Spirit, when you hear the word of God, the word of God is the active agent. It says it's alive, Hebrews 4.16. It begins to activate once the Holy Spirit brings conviction. I hope you're, under, hope you're listening about salvation. And then that allows us, because we still have the moral law written in our heart, Romans 2.15, and now we can make a choice. And that choice, you know how many choices that you have when you hear the gospel. That may be your last opportunity. And so take advantage of that because a person's heart can grow cold. And so if you are convicted of your sin and lost condition that's by the Holy Spirit and the gospel, you can make a choice. You've got a moral law written in you. Somebody talks about total depravity. Well, it depends how you define total depravity. I ask this question about total depravity. Does it mean you don't have the moral law written in your heart if you're not saved? No, you still have the moral law written in your heart. What is the moral law written in your heart? That is God's, in, uh, God's uh, enlightenment that brings the, uh, the, the soul to life. There is a vacuum in every human being's heart that uh, must de desires to be filled that can only be filled with God. Now because of being spiritually alienated from God, because of the sin of Adam, our great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, we too are born in sin and shaped in iniquity, and we cannot choose God. We can't. Except that we have the Holy Spirit who was sent into the world to bring what? To bring conviction and to reprove the world of judgment of sin and of righteousness. And of sin in the sense that we can then be enlightened and recognize that we are lost and in need of a Savior. Of judgment and the fact that we are lost and knowing that eternal hell is coming. 
of righteousness, knowing that only righteousness, the perfect righteousness, is the thing that is needed to get us saved. And so that's the Holy Spirit. He brings all this into our mind and our heart at the moment of salvation. And Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 14, what does it say? How can they believe unless they hear? And how can they hear unless someone is sent? And so that's your job, that's my job. That's it. What do you hear on this earth for if you're saved? It doesn't matter what's happening in this world right now. Uh, you know, we're, we've got all of our plans, don't we? It's okay to do some of those things. Seek God. Let Him lead you. Walk in the Spirit. It's okay. This job, that job, education, all of these things and so forth because you're going to take Christ with you wherever you go. That's your uh, mission field until God calls you elsewhere. But our job is this. We're saved. We're living the kingdom. Everything else in this life is not important. What is important is, is that we are yielding to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit who's convicting us and the Word of God, which is, uh, is our rule book, guiding us. So, if a person that is a Christian uh, is alive in the days before the rapture, then we will be caught up before the tribulation period, which is not for the saints. It's for Israel. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the time of Daniel's 70th week. Are you ready for that rapture? On the other hand, if you go into the tribulation period, you're not saved. You're not Christians. You may come to Christ during the tribulation period. Yes, you must still believe the gospel, but uh, the Holy Spirit's not going to come and place you into the body of Christ. That is the distinction that makes us Christians. What were they waiting for at Pentecost? They were waiting for the Holy Spirit. You mean he wasn't there before? Well, he was there because he was on, on, on the present. But he was not inside. What? Don't you know your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit you have of God? You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God who is in you. And we are baptized by one Spirit into the body of Christ. That only takes place during the church age. We're not there in the tribulation period. All right. So uh, those, like I say, that uh, uh, are there in the tribulation period are saints, but they're called tribulation saints. And that's what we find. Let's jump ahead here. And I'll begin to wrap things up because I want to show you this. Uh, I want to show you this chart and begin to wrap things up. But look at it. I, we, we didn't get that far, but let's go to verse 4. I saw thrones and they that sat on them. We'll get to this next week. And judgment was committed to them. Then I saw what? The souls. I saw the souls of those who had been what? Beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast of the image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. What? This confused me so much because I thought, where's, where, why isn't he speaking about the Christians here? We're not in this picture here. This is, who is it? It's a tribulation saint. This is talking about the people that lost their heads, got, got cut up. It isn't talking about Paul. It isn't talking about John. It isn't talking about uh, any of the Christians throughout history. Where are they? They're in heaven with Christ. So, you know, this argument that we're making and putting together the pieces, we put place pieces of a puzzle together until you can see the full picture. And so, uh, these are the ones, the souls of those who've been what, beheaded. So this is going to be the, the, the major form of execution. It's going to be against believers in Christ during the time of uh, the tribulation period, and I'm certain to share uh, Jews as well. All right. Uh... I'm, I'm going to wrap these things up, but I, I want to make, I want I want us just to look quickly here back at uh, verse uh, number three. And the devil and Satan bound him a thousand years and cast him in the bottom of his pit, shut him out, and set a seal on him so that he should not deceive the nations. All right, um, he was uh, put into the bottomless pit. He was taken by an angel, and an angel put a, placed him in the bottomless pit. All right, um, but then it says that um, it says that he was sealed, and 
you know what the, the, the word means here? It's the same seal that a king uses from his ring. If you've ever noticed, there's a, a wax, a portion of wax that's placed on a, on a, a, a letter that has a, a legal importance. And the seal that is placed on that is the authority of uh, the king. And so if anybody sees that as they're going from kingdom to kingdom in ancient years, then they'd recognize this is based upon the authority and the armies of that kingdom. That's what this seal means in the Greek. Uh, and so he has placed this seal upon him. Everybody knows, don't touch it. He's there, he's stuck. Uh, that he should uh, de deceive the nations uh, no more. Uh, but he's put in the bottomless pit. I want to make these comments. Where's the bottomless pit? First of all, understand this about the bottomless pit. What is it saying? It's that's self descriptive. Come on now. It doesn't have a bottom. There's no bottom. Does, does Hades have a bottom? Yeah. Does hell have a bottom? Yeah. This is a place of judgment that doesn't have a bottom. So they're, you know, kind of like uh, floating. Uh, they can't get out. There's a, there's a, a place of entry. Uh, there's a key that is used, Revelation chapter 9, 1 and 2. And uh, it's, it's that key is of the authority that God gives to open it or to close it. It's just an angel takes Satan, places him in the bottomless pit. And there he's at. And, but it also says he's got chains on. Chains. Now, how do you have uh, chains on a spiritual being? Well, obviously, God is able to make uh, spiritual chains, things that will, will contain him as well as the bottomless pit. And, and the last thing, let, let me make uh, this comparison with Tartarus. I want to read a couple verses in close. Tartarus, uh, the definition that is given, by the way, Tartarus was a Greek term also, just like Gehenna was a physical term of a place where the, uh, was the trash dump that burned uh, continually. Well, Tartarus was a Greek uh, term uh, in Greek mythology where they placed the lesser gods or the evil gods and the evil people went to this place called Tartarus. And that's the Greek meaning for it. But uh, for the church meaning, uh, it's the lowest condition of abasement for those rebellious angels. So these were angels who did heinous things that were the worst of the worst. Were they worse than those that went in the bottomless pit? Are you listening? Yes. How do we know that they were worse? Because they were bound with everlasting chains. Uh, let me read it. 2 Peter 2.4 For if God did not spare the angels having sinned but having cast them down to, and the King James Version uses the word hell. It is not the best term because it's not Gehenna, it's not the Greek word, it's Tartarus. Now, let's know this, that the people who translated our translations uh, can make errors in translating and you can still get the understandable meaning as a place of torment. But those who can study and understand the Greek and can put the manuscripts together can come up with more accurate translations. The King James Version is not the authorized version. Authorized by whom? It's authorized by King James. But it's not authorized by God. Why did God wait till 1611? And why did he include the apocryphal books which are not inspired books of God, not uh, Theops Numa, which is God breathed. And I'm bringing this up just because occasionally we're going to come up with a word like this, and this word is called Tartarus, and uh, it's not down to hell, as the King James Version says. So uh, that's, that's, that's a, a small uh, error there. Does that mean that the scripture is in error? No, because it's the autographs of the apostles and the prophets that are the without error. In the translations, it's easy for some to, 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 to be made, but we have we have many trans, we have many manuscripts that we can compare and come up with conclusions. And he delivered them into chains of darkness 
watch this, to be reserved unto judgment. So what about these uh, uh, fallen angels that are in Tartarus? They don't get out in Revelation chapter 9 and 1 and go all over the world and torment men. They can't kill them, as the Bible says. They don't get out. What does it say? It says they are in eternal chains of judgment until to be reserved unto the judgment. So this is a different place than the pit. And uh, so do we know why that these were uh, ended up going into the um, into Tartarus? Well, Jude verse 6. We had just mentioned 2 Peter 2.4. 2 Peter 2.4. But now we're looking at Jude verse 6. It says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. What are we talking about? Their natural state. They were angels. And Genesis chapter 6 says they came down and they cohabitated with the daughters of men. There were sexual activities taking place. There were the Nephilim and giants in the land. And God was not going to allow there to be another species on earth. And that was exactly what was taking place. And so any of these uh, human daughters of men that allowed themselves to be taken in by the angels, the fallen angels, they had no chance for salvation because salvation is only made for Adam's family. That's it. And we're not going to have a, a whole population and a whole race that is mixed with uh, a, another species. And that's exactly what's happening right now in, in labs around America and in China and all of these other places. Things that are happening. Even these AI creatures are becoming sentient or senti sentient which means that they will have uh, personality, they will have feelings, they will have knowledge, they will be able to make judgments, etc., etc. Within the next uh, two years, they say it's, we, we may have some serious issues. God's not going to allow men to have relations with robots uh, like a man and a woman does today, whether in holy matrimony or, or apart from, and certainly, certainly from, apart from. Not going to allow that to happen. That's inappropriate. That's an abomination. God is coming back to destroy the world. It's the same thing He did in the days of Noah. That's why Jesus said it in the days of Noah. Is that every man did that which was right in his own eyes continually. We're coming to a place now where uh, Isaiah says bad is going to be good and good is going to be bad. And the line is drawn. If you're a Christian... You already have, you already know it, you have that uh, desire and conviction to live in the light, not that you can't step out into darkness, you can. But God brings conviction, we have the Holy Spirit, and also chastisement, let's thank God. He chastens those whom He loves. And so, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> that is why God destroyed the world. That is why God's going to destroy the world very soon. And I do mean that. Uh, you know, if, if, uh, if you're listening to certain Bible study teachers, John MacArthur, if you're listening to uh, Dr. John Barnett, if you're listening to Amir Safadi, uh, if you're listening to uh, the old uh, pastors, uh, Adrian Rogers and uh, David Jeremiah, if you're listening to uh, our, our buddy, uh, uh, through the Bible, Jay Burnham, Jay Burnham McGee. All right, it's it's clear. The time is short. What are you doing about it? And uh, God's going to come. He's going to destroy the world. So um, they left their own habitation that He had reserved them in everlasting chains under the judgment of the great day. So these are those that had fallen, and uh, we we could we could say a lot more. Uh, we will uh, maybe another time. Uh, so those are the differences. Sheol and Hades, the same. Uh, you've got uh, 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 um, the, the bad side of Hades. You now have paradise, which has been taken to heaven. The person that dies now goes presently into the presence of the Lord or down to Hades, depending on whether you're a believer or not. And then comes the great white throne judgment. And it's the same picture that we have here. And I'll read this to you, that the church age is 2,000 years, or approximately, and it's been that. 
And God says uh, that in the scriptures that one day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is a day has been two days. And if you go back to Adam and uh, on, on the time frame, uh, you can go in the book of Genesis, first uh, few chapters, uh, and you see it, uh, that Adam lived until Noah, 1,656 years. I figured that out just going through the, uh, through the uh, uh, times given of their life. And there's been 6,000 years right up until the time of the seven-year tribulation. But before that takes place, we've got a rapture that's going to take place. Church is going to be taken out of the way. Guys, we'll be working with Israel. You don't read anything about the church doing exploits and going here and evangelizing there. and You don't re read anything about the, the great uh, missionaries that are going around and doing this. You do read about the 144,000 Jews that are going to be like Paul the Apostle. That it says they will follow Christ. And it says they will follow Christ anywhere. What does it say there? Revelation chapter 7, the first nine verses, eight verses, and also Revelation 14. Okay. And it says they're, they're, they make themselves virgins, meaning they're not living lives so that they can f fulfill the, the uh, desires that uh, a, a, a human normally would seek to, which is good in holy matrimony, but they're giving everything to Christ. All right. Uh, then you've got uh, the seven-year tribulation. Then you've got the second coming. Christ come. By the way, the rapture, we're up in the air. We're up in the air. Uh, the second coming here is going to be uh, here where Christ comes down with his armies. And the fight is on the earth. The fight's on the earth. And uh, then Christ remains on the earth. Sets up his millennial kingdom. Satan is bound. There's the thousand, and then the thousand year reign of Christ. And then Satan is released. We're going to see that later in uh, Revelation chapter uh, 20. And after that, the great white throne judgment. Finally, we have the eternal state, the new heaven and the new earth, which is our eternal state. We see this arrow here that's pointing this way, on and on forevermore. And I just, I guess I could say to those that are believers, uh, the Bible says that about God, in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, our pleasures forevermore. If, if, if you're thinking about heaven and you're thinking about, you know, uh, what am I going to be doing there? Uh, we'll be doing all kinds of responsible things. I was just thinking today, some of the trials that I had to experience today and I was, the Lord impressing upon me is the fact that, uh, John, I'm getting you ready for this specific position in heaven. Each of us the trials, the little difficulties, the things that press against us and how we respond to it. Are we going to be critical? Are we going to be crying out to God? Are we going to be little babies? Or are we maturing? Are we allowing God's Holy Spirit to cause us to uh, get better, not bitter? Because we're our place in heaven, and it's coming close, it's coming soon. Our place in heaven is going to be based upon what... Christ did in our life to conform us to Christ's image. And there's going to be positions up there of necessity of those that will have responsibility to do certain things that he's prepared you for. And you will fit like a glove. Uh, and, uh, but in the meantime, let us uh, yield right of way. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At the right hand are pleasures forevermore. And the thing about hell that makes hell is not the fire. And it's not going to be uh, even the, uh, maybe the wrong type of people. What is going to make hell, hell is this. It's actually two things. One is God's absence. All it is is darkness and evil. There is no good. Can you imagine there not being any good? And can you imagine there being all good? And to have to be judged and to walk through that door, the thing that will make hell, hell, is there will be no goodness. No goodness. Never. That's the second thing. It'll never end. But to the child of God that uh, repents and embraces Christ, it's going to be eternal joy and pleasures in God, in Christ. 
I hope that uh, you would contemplate and seek God and ask Him, I don't want to live a life of sin apart from you. Holy Spirit, convict my heart that I might turn from my sins and be able to place my faith in Jesus Christ alone as my Lord and Savior, His precious blood to cleanse my sin. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Word of God, even as we see here at the close of the uh, book of Revelation, chapter 20, which is going to be the end before the millennium, and then the millennium, and then the great white throne judgment, and then the eternal state. Father, uh, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, to give us uh, opportunity to make a decision for you. Thank you for those of us that have trusted Christ. I thank you, Lord, for coming into my heart. Pray for everyone else that's listening in, that they must turn from their sin under the convicting work of the Holy Spirit in order to trust Christ and receive Him in their heart. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of works. By, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.